The Rhino Chill intranasal cooling system brings the benefits of rapid induction of therapeutic hypothermia targeted to the brain to patients presenting with cardiac arrest, stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, and traumatic brain injury. It is the only commercially available cooling device that employs three distinct mechanisms of heat exchange, evaporation, convection, and conduction. The Rhino Chill has been designed with portability and rapid application at its core. It's intended for use in a variety of clinical settings and by multiple healthcare professions. The Rhino Chill system may be administered by any medical personnel qualified by training and experience, such as physicians, nurses, pre-hospital emergency responders, and technicians in emergency and intensive care settings. The Rhino Chill system consists of three separate components, the transnasal evaporative cooling catheter, the coolant, and the control unit. Let's look at these a little closer. The transnasal evaporative cooling catheter is a sterile, single-use device that delivers the cooling vapor into the nasopharynx to begin the induction of hypothermia. The catheter assembly is one continuous part that contains the connector to link it to the control unit, the coolant bottle interface and cap, the filter, the liquid flow indicator, and the delivery tubing. The catheter ends with the cannula hub and the two nasal cannulae, which are inserted through the patient's nostril to deliver the liquid gas mixture through the 24 ports sitting within the nasopharynx, allowing direct cooling of the base of the skull and the brain itself. The coolant is a completely inert liquid that evaporates easily and forms a fine vapor when pressurized gas is passed through the system. It is supplied in one liter single use bottles that last approximately 30 minutes at the medium flow rate setting. The control unit controls the flow rate of the coolant gas mixture and monitors the system status when in use. The unit operates from an internal rechargeable battery with sufficient capacity for a four hour runtime, but can also be powered from an external 12 volt DC power supply or the supplied AC power supply, making it suitable for use in all areas. A source of pressurized gas must be used with the system in either oxygen or breathable air at pressures from 3.1 to 4.8 bar, 45 to 70 PSI, with a minimum recommended usage pressure of 3 bar and a flow rate of 60 liters per minute. The control unit can be outfitted with accessory bags constructed from a protective wipe clean material to assist with infection prevention and control measures. It can also be configured to carry a gas cylinder, mount to an IV pole, dock to the wall of an emergency response vehicle, hang from the bed rails, or be carried over the shoulder. The RhinoChill intranasal cooling system is intended for rapid induction of hypothermia during cardiac arrest and following resuscitation. The RhinoChill is also intended for temperature reduction in other patients where clinically indicated, such as after a recent cerebral ischemic event caused by stroke, cerebral bleed, or traumatic brain injury. The RhinoChill should only be used in patients with a protected airway or other type of assisted ventilation in progress. It can be utilized and applied in the field or hospital setting. As is standard with all hypothermia treatments, the RhinoChill should not be applied to patients known to have conditions that are contraindicated for systemic hypothermia, such as Raynaud's disease and sickle cell disease. It is also not recommended for patients with temperature-sensitive pathologies, for example, serum cold agglutinins and Berger's disease. Those with bleeding disorders or who require supplemental oxygen for normal respiration should also not receive the RhinoChill. Finally, if the patient has an intranasal obstruction that prevents the full insertion of the nasal cannula or a known base of skull fracture, they should not be treated with the RhinoChill system. Remove the pouch containing the catheter from the box. Inspect the pouch to ensure that it is not damaged. Remove the catheter from the pouch without using any sharp objects to open any of the packaging and inspect the catheter for cuts, broken connectors, or other abnormalities. Inspect the nasal cannula and ensure that the tips are smooth and round with no burrs, nicks, or cracks. Inspect the coolant bottle for intact end caps and a legible label. If you've not already done so, connect the control unit to the pressurized gas supply. Turn the setting control knob to the check position. The battery light should illuminate green. If the battery light illuminates yellow, Plug the control unit into an external power supply to recharge the battery. Open the gas supply valve and the gas cylinder light should illuminate green. Remove the cap from the coolant bottle, but retain for use when disposing of the bottle. The simplest place for this is in the accessory bag pocket. 
Remove the seal from the coolant bottle. Place the coolant bottle in the control unit holder, making sure the bottle is well seated and a click noise is heard as the bottle is secured in place. The coolant bottle light should then illuminate green. Ensure the bottle latch is fully engaged over the top of the coolant bottle. Place the catheter bottle interface over the top of the coolant bottle and tighten the catheter bottle cap around the coolant bottle neck. This should be hand tightened only with no tools used to perform this task. Sometimes this can be a little tricky, so if you prefer, you can always do this before the coolant bottle is placed into the control unit. Insert the catheter connector into the control unit catheter connection. The catheter connector light should then illuminate green as the connector clicks into place. Take hold of the catheter by the cannula hub so that the nasal cannula are pointing away from you. Move the setting control knob to the medium setting. Confirm that the spray is emitting from all ports on each of the cannula and that the nasal cannula indicator light illuminates green. There may be a slight delay of a couple seconds before spray is seen while the catheter is primed with the liquid. Confirm that there are no leaks in any part of the catheter. Kink one of the nasal cannula near its hub to check that the overpressure sensors are working correctly and that the flow stops when the system alarms. The nasal cannula indicator light should then turn red. The flow indicator light will not be illuminated and the flow indicator on the top of the bottle will not be moving. Move the setting control knob to check position to clear the overpressure alarm. Confirm that the patient's airway is protected. Keep the patient's mouth open to vent vapor. Keep the patient's head horizontal unless otherwise indicated by patient treatment requirements. As is standard of care, keep an eye on the patient's oxygen saturation levels throughout the cooling process. Note, it is important that you do not position the coolant bottle above the level of the patient's head as liquid may siphon down the cannula to the patient. Hold the catheter so that the cannula hub is in your right hand and the rest of the cannula tubing is in your left. Place the cannula in the patient's nostrils, inserting the cannula directly back towards the patient's ears rather than up the nostrils towards the forehead. Do not use force when inserting the cannula and lubricate if necessary. The hub should rest on the patient's upper lip and the tubing lies across the patient's right cheek so as to ensure that the directional ports are in the correct orientation. Confirm that the nasal cannula are inserted correctly by ensuring that the top of the cannula hub faces upwards with the convex surface and the embossed logo sitting directly under the patient's nose. The R and L indicators on the hub correspond to the patient's right and left rather than the operator's. Do not occlude the patient's nostrils, as the vapor is also vented from the nose during use. An optional strap can be used around the patient's head to secure the catheter in place. The device is now ready to deliver the cooling vapor and start the induction of hypothermia. Turn the flow rate to high for 30 seconds or until the liquid flow indicator rotates briskly. Once the indicator is rotating, turn the setting control knob to the desired flow rate and the green flow indicator will illuminate. Medium and high flow rates are to be used for initiating cooling, with the low flow rate reserved for maintenance cooling. If using the device to treat a neurological patient with increased intracranial pressure or pyrexia, the high flow rate should be selected as their initial treatment rate. The patient must be monitored regularly throughout the time the rhino chill is in use, and if tympanic temperature monitoring is available, then it should be recorded at the first available opportunity. However, if in a pre-hospital setting and no accurate method of monitoring temperature is available, then a first measurement on arrival at the ER is acceptable. It should be recognized that due to the production of a brain decor to periphery temperature gradient and the targeted nature of the RhinoChill device, an initial first temperature reading taken rectally will not be an accurate reflection of the core or cerebral temperature and should not be routinely used. A full bottle used on a medium flow rate will provide approximately 25 to 30 minutes of cooling. When there is approximately 200 milliliters of coolant remaining, a yellow warning light will illuminate and a warning tone will be sounded to alert the user to prepare for a change of coolant bottle. The coolant will run out between 4 and 8 minutes after the warning activation if not replaced. Further usage times depending on flow rates can be found in the accompanying product information and should be made available to all users. If the coolant runs out, the coolant icon will illuminate red, the flow will stop, and an audible alarm will sound until the setting knob is turned to the check position and the coolant bottle is replaced. Other audible alarms and warning lights are further explained in the instructions and all users should familiarize themselves with the troubleshooting guide prior to using the device. Changing the coolant bottle while the patient is undergoing treatment is a rapid and simple task to perform. 
First, ensure the setting control knob is in the checked position. Note this will ensure the coolant out alarm is muted during bottle replacement. Note, the check position is also the alarm muted position. Unscrew the bottle interface from the coolant bottle and remove the empty bottle from the bottle holder. The coolant icon should be illuminated red. Replace the cap on the empty bottle and dispose of it at the earliest opportunity following the recommended local disposal guidelines. Place a full bottle into the holder and attach to the catheter assembly as was demonstrated earlier. Move the setting knob to the desired flow rate and ensure that the liquid flow indicator begins turning briskly again. Regular temperature measurements should be taken and recorded to ensure overcooling does not occur. Once in the hospital setting, regularly monitor the patient's blood oxygen saturation. Adjustments to the patient's ventilator settings should be made to optimize blood gases. The RhinoChill device will remain in use with the patient until a suitable opportunity to transfer the patient onto the receiving unit's standard hypothermia maintenance regimen. Users of the system also need to be aware that while relatively rare, there are three recognized side effects that the patient may experience, which operators should remain alert for. These are minor epistaxis, seen in 3 to 4% of cases, white nose, seen in approximately 10% of cases. This is most likely to occur in the low flow states, such as cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock, and periorbital subcutaneous emphysema, seen in only 1% of cases. All of these occurrences are expected to be self-limiting and to resolve spontaneously. Once the decision has been made to stop cooling with the rhino chill, turn the control knob setting to the off position. Close the gas supply valve and then remove the nasal cannula from the patient's nose. The cooling catheter assembly can then be disconnected from the control unit and the coolant bottle and can be disposed of as per local biohazardous waste guidelines. The coolant bottle can then be removed and the cap replaced. Remember to plug the control unit into an external power supply so that the battery can recharge and be ready for the next use. Users should observe and comply with all national and regional regulations for disposing of the coolant. Any small coolant spills should be absorbed by an inert material, such as sand or absorbent granules, and placed in a plastic container for transfer and disposal. Do not drain any coolant into drains or water supplies. Small quantities of less than 200 milliliters can be disposed of in waste that is sent to an authorized landfill site. Larger quantities can be incinerated by a licensed waste disposal organization at a site equipped with an afterburner and scrubber. Explicit details on disposal of the coolant liquid can be found in the material safety data sheet supplied with the device. Immediately following patient use, the exterior surface of the control unit and the accessory bags should be cleaned using a dampened cloth with warm water and a diluted, mild, non-abrasive, non-staining standard hospital disinfectant or detergent. Alternatively, seek advice from your department's infection prevention and control manager for the recommended solution for hard surfaces as used within your unit. When the device is not in use, ensure that it is connected to an external power supply to ensure continuous charging of the unit. At least once a week, the battery should be checked by unplugging the control unit from the external power supply and turning the control knob to the check position. I hope you found this video informative and educational and that you will go on to use the RhinoChill system to help your patients increase their chances of survival from life-threatening cerebral ischemic events. Thank you for your attention.